So this morning is the first Sunday of Advent, and uh, we're going to be looking at the themes of the Advent candle, starting with hope this morning. Um, and again, my hope, my hope is that, especially for those of you who are going through challenging times, or if you know someone in your life who is, that this would bring the hope of Christ to you this morning. If you're unfamiliar with the book of Isaiah or who Isaiah is, it's in the Old Testament. He, Isaiah was a prophet. <clears throat> and the book of Isaiah is a collection of his prophecies around the 8th century before Christ. Um, prophets were raised up by God whenever the nation of Israel was straying away from uh, the covenant that he had to call them into. So whenever they were disobeying in various ways, God would raise up a prophet to be his mouthpiece to say, basically, repent, turn back, or the curses of the covenant will come on you. Um, at the time of Isaiah, Israel was in pretty bad moral decay with idolatry and empty worship, social injustice. And Isaiah came to warn them that judgment was coming if they would not repent. Sadly, they did not repent. Instead of trusting in God, they turned to a, a neighboring nation, Assyria, for protection uh, and help. And in chapter 8, before this chapter that we just read, we see even the people are turning to mediums and spiritists seeking uh, that kind of supernatural help instead of the help of God. And so eventually, unfortunately, Assyria was going to, is going to turn on Israel and take them off into captivity. But I want to just look again at this, what's happening in Isaiah 9 and pay attention to some of the words that you read there and just how the picture it paints of the emotional climate in Israel at that time. Gloom, distress, darkness, shadow of death, defeat, yoke that burdens them, rod of their oppressor, battle, blood, all this language of, of just war and, and oppression and suffering and tragedy that is going on at this time. But in the midst of that becomes this prophecy of judgment. I'm sorry, this prophecy of hope in the midst of the judgment. It says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, so even though things are dark and gloomy and war is breaking out and all these things, are, this judgment is coming, in the midst of that, God gives this promise that a child will be born. Not just any child, but this child will be the wonderful counselor, bringing wisdom to the nation. He'll be called mighty God, this child. will be God in human flesh, the everlasting father of his people, the prince of peace, and that he will reign over the throne of David forever and ever. So there's hope even in the midst of the darkness for the people of Israel. And I want to use this this morning and talk a little bit about hope because we have a crisis of hope in America these days, in case you have not been paying attention. Since 2014, life expectancy in the United States has fallen every year, amazingly. After all these years of figuring out how to live longer, now life expectancy has fallen. One of the reasons is what some researchers, Ann Case and Angus Deaton, called deaths of despair. There's been a significant increase in deaths of despair which are deaths due to drug overdose, suicide, or alcoholic liver disease. That even during, especially during COVID, there was a 28% increase in drug overdose deaths. That more and more people are turning to drugs, drinking, suicide, to escape the pain and suffering of life, contributing to this decreasing life expectancy. And there's many factors you might point to, like economic challenges, loneliness, lack of community, or social connection, feelings of powerless. But underneath it all, what, I, I, if you have to sum it up in one word, it would probably be hopelessness, right? That there's an increase in hopelessness. People looking at the future and not seeing any reason to believe that it's going to be any better than it is today. A loss of hope that your situation will ever improve that there is anything worth looking forward to, that you'll ever be happy again, that anyone or anything can truly help your situation. 
the loss of hope that pain and suffering has meaning, the loss of hope that death is not the end. These, this loss of hope has caused so many to turn to avenues just to numb the pain, leading to these deaths of despair, leading to this decrease in life expectancy. And if you look around the world, the loss of hope is understandable. The economy does not seem to be moving in the right direction, I would say, right? Causing more people to feel panic and insecure about their life. People are more isolated than ever. Society is more fragmented than ever. Birth rates are declining, marriage rates are declining. People don't want to get married as often or bring people into this world anymore. So where is the hope to be found? Where are you looking to to say tomorrow's going to be better than it is today? Education, you know, maybe if we learn more, then we'll figure things out. Technology, politics, that's your cue to laugh right there. You know, as far as technology has advanced, it's not seeming to uh, help us, is it? It's, it's increasing polarization and fragmentation, increasing anxiety and depression. Politics, politicians are not giving us great reason for hope that they're going to figure out and bring hope to our country, to our world. Education seems more agenda-driven than truth-driven than ever before. People are losing faith in that. Again, even the novels you read seem more and more about dystopian futures. You realize, you know, you reckon it, you see that? Like all those movies and novels that come out just painting a bleak future for us. And again, I recognize that for many of you this hits home because either it's something you've been through personally or you know someone who has gone through this who because of the suffering of their life, the pain of their life, they don't know where to turn, they don't know where to find hope. And maybe you have a loved one who has turn to drugs, turn to drinking, to suicide even. Where is the hope? There is reason for hope. As we turn to Advent, as we look towards Christmas, there is reason for hope. To us, a child is born, a son is given. The hope is found in Jesus, and I want to proclaim him to you this morning and why he is the place, the one in which we find hope. Remember what Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15. He said, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. My hope this morning is that you would come away with a reason for the hope that you have. If you trust in Jesus, that you would be able to articulate the reason for the hope that you have to those in your life who are suffering. To those in your life who have no hope who feel hopeless, that you would be able to live this out and give a reason for the hope that you have. And if you this morning are listening and feeling the hopelessness, that you would hear the reason for the hope that I have, that the Bible gives us. There's three reasons for the Christian hope that I want to borrow from a Jonathan Edwards sermon that he entitled Christian Happiness. He preached this in 1721, 300 years ago, at the age of 18. And as an 18-year-old, he was a better preacher than I ever was, and so I'm going to borrow from him for his reasons he says that we have for hope. The first reason he said is this. As a Christian, because of the gospel, because of Jesus, we know that our bad things will turn out for good. I mean, the story of Jesus is full of seemingly bad things. You've got this unwed teenager who becomes pregnant, probably faced all kinds of judgment in her community. She's forced to travel with Joseph late in her pregnancy, to Bethlehem because of the census, forced to give birth in some cave or some stall, wherever it might be. After he's born, this genocidal king wants to kill all the babies because he hears that there's a Messiah coming, so they have to flee to Egypt and live as refugees until it's safe to come back. As Jesus grows up, the religious leaders among him want him dead. His closest followers betray and deny him. He's unjustly persecuted. He's nailed to a cross. And even on the cross, God the Father turns his back on him, it seems, as he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You want to talk about suffering? You want to talk about hardships of life? Jesus knows suffering. He knows pain. But none of that suffering was meaningless. All of that was part of a greater story, that God was using the life and death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, to bring salvation to the world, to make a way for us to be restored to him. 
and the hope that Jesus brings that somehow, in a way that we can't always comprehend this side of eternity, that God is always working all things together for our good, always bringing good, that our bad things will turn out for good. Paul writes this in Romans 8, 28 to 29. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined <coughs> to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. As far as I'm concerned, this is the most hopeful verse in the Bible as far as this life goes for me. <coughs> I can't tell you how many times in my life that I have looked back and had to turn to this. As I look at my life and I don't understand where the good is, I hang on to this and I stand on this promise that God is always working all things together for good. And that good doesn't mean that everything's going to turn around and be rosy. The good, according to verse 29, is that he is going to use everything that happens to you to conform you to the likeness of his son, to make you more like Jesus, to mold you into a person of love and joy and peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That if you will submit whatever happens to you in your life, whether it's crippling illness, death of a loved one, loss of a job, painful divorce, whatever it might be, if you'll submit it to him, that he will bring good out of everything that you go through. That is hope. That is a real and certain hope for this life. And you think of the view that that gives you on suffering, that God is always working in everything for our good and how different it is than the way the world views suffering. Richard Schweder, who's a cultural anthropologist at the University of Chicago, he wrote this, <coughs> he put it this way, he said, the reigning metaphor of the contemporary secular view is suffering is just chance misfortune. The sufferer is a victim under attack from impersonal forces devoid of intentionality, and that means suffering is separated from the narrative structure of human life, a kind of noise, an accidental interference into the life drama of the sufferer. In other words, for most people, if there's no God, then there's no point, there's no meaning to suffering. It's just an accidental interference breaking in on my life that I had planned for myself. It's not part of anything larger. But as a believer, as a Christian, as someone who knows Jesus, I know that whatever happens to me is not random. It is part of a larger story, that even the worst things that can happen to me, God is using them all for good. It may be evil, but God can bring good out of it. It's all part of what he is doing to conform us to the image of his son. Sometimes he allows it to do just that, and there's other times that he allows things to happen to equip us. Sometimes the good that he brings out of suffering is to allow us to go through things that will equip us to, to, to minister to others who are suffering, to reach out and bring hope to others and encouragement to others in a way that others could not because maybe they haven't gone through the same thing you've gone through. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7, Paul writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you will share in our comfort. Again, the point here is that God is always bringing good out of the bad. Sometimes he allows things to happen, and he uses it to mold us to make us more like Jesus. Sometimes the good that he brings out of it is to equip us so that then we can minister to others and bring comfort and encouragement to others out of the comfort that we've received from God. It doesn't make it any easier going through it. But again, it's keeping in mind there's hope. It's part of a larger narrative. It's not meaningless. What I'm going through will equip me so that I can then minister to others in a way that I couldn't if I hadn't gone through that. Viktor Frankl, he wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning, reflecting on the time that he was in the Nazi concentration camp. And he was talking about how he got through and survived, you know, emotionally without breaking down in the midst of the concentration camp. One of the things he said when he was particularly discouraged, he said this, suddenly I saw myself standing on the platform of a well-lit, warm and pleasant lecture room in front of me sat an attentive audience on comfortable upholstered seats. I was giving a lecture on the psychology of the concentration camp. 
By this method, I succeeded somehow in rising above the situation, above the sufferings of the moment. He talks about how he was able to find meaning even in the suffering of the concentration camp as those around him who he loved were being killed by seeing how it might be used in future years so that he could then bring wisdom and bring ministry and bring comfort to others. It's a, it's a great picture, I think, of just what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 1 there, that sometimes we go through things, and as hard as they are, that one day God will use it so that we can minister to others in a way we couldn't have if we hadn't gone through it. As Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. If we know there's a why, if we know that God is always at work for our good, that we can bear with almost any how, because we know that whatever suffering we're going through, it is part of a larger narrative. God is at work. God is still sovereign. He is still loving you in the midst of whatever suffering, whatever evil. There's always hope. So that is the first rock-solid hope we have. Our bad things will turn out for good. Our bad things will turn out for our good. Whatever evil others or Satan may inflict on us, God is able to use all of it for good, to make us more like Christ, to equip us to minister to others. The second reason for our hope is that our good things will never be taken away from us. Our bad things will turn out for our good, and our good things can never be taken away from us. Again, you take away God from the equation, and you look at this world, and everything is slipping away. If all there is is this life, if all you have to reason to hope is this life, Everything is slipping away. Every relationship will eventually be severed by death, yours or someone else's. Your health will continue to decline. Everything that you have slips away as you, as you age. But in Christ, we have hope that our good things will never be taken away from us. So again, if your hope is in anything in this world, you're in trouble. Tim Keller put it, if your ultimate love and joy is found in the treasures of this world, then suffering will rob you of your joy and make you sadder and madder. But if your ultimate love and joy is found in God, then suffering will drive you deeper into the source of that joy. I love that. When you go through times of suffering, it reveals where you've put your hope. And if your hope is in anything in this world, in your money, in your reputation, in your health, and any of that, and you'll shake your fist and wonder, why, God? Why would you allow this to happen? It just causes you to become sadder and madder. But if your hope is in Christ, if your hope is in him, that all suffering can do is just drive you deeper into God, the true source of your joy. Your good things will never be taken away from you. First Peter 1, 3 through 5, Peter said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter says, because of the resurrection, because we now believe in Jesus and we're connected to him, there is an inheritance stored up for us. Whatever that may be, I don't know, but it means it can't be touched by the things of this world, by the suffering of this world that our good things can never be taken from us. They are kept for us, protected from us. And so in Romans 8, 35 to 39, Paul says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your good things will never be taken from you. The thing that matters the most is yours forever. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Someone say amen. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 
So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Wow. Just read that one one more time. Paul dares to call them light and momentary troubles. This is a man who cataloged, you know, all the times he was shipwrecked and beaten, persecuted. And he calls them light and momentary troubles compared to the eternal glory that is to come. Your good things will never be taken from you. You don't just want to live forever. You want to know that love is eternal. That beyond the grave, that love <laughs> is eternal. That death is not the end. And that everything that we do matters eternally. And in the gospel, all of that is true. All the things that our hearts long for will be ours forever. Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so Paul says, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. As long as you are living for the things of this world, they're going to be slipping away. As long as your hope is in the people and the relationships and the stuff of this world, it'll slip away, and when you lose it, you'll just become sadder and madder. Put your hope in God. Put your hope in Christ. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, and it'll be never be taken from you. Your labor will never be in vain. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 10, 42. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. I love that. It's not about having to go on the mission field to do something incredible for God, right? It's about giving a cup of cold water to a little one in the name of Jesus. And he says, that matters eternally. That matters eternally. Everything that you do for the Lord matters eternally. Your good things will never be taken from you. The reasons for our hope, our bad things will turn out for good. Our good things can never be taken away from us, and the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. As much as atheists might want to try to come to terms with death and just kind of pass it off as just, well, it's just part of life, we know in our hearts that it is wrong. We know in our hearts that death is wrong. It is unnatural. It is an enemy. The pain that happens when someone that we love is, is taken away from us, we know in our hearts that it's wrong. It was not meant to be that way. It is unnatural. It is an intruder. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus must reign until he has put all the enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's an enemy. It's not just a part of life. Death is an enemy. It's an intruder into God's good world. It was not meant to be this way. The writer of Ecclesiastes tells us in 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time, and he has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And as much as you might want to, as an atheist, try to just explain it away and just pretend it away, God has put eternity in our hearts. We know that death is not should not be the end, that it is an intruder. The hope of Christmas, the hope of the gospel, the hope of Jesus is that death is not the end and the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. That is hope. If all we have hope for is this world, Paul says we're to be pitied. If all we can hope in is that, you know, maybe we'll get a, a nice house, maybe we'll have a nice car, maybe we'll have a nice marriage, if that's all we're hoping for, We're hoping in the wrong things. Because it's all going to slip away. And death comes for everyone. But because of Jesus, death is not the end. John eleven twenty five 25 to 26. Jesus, 
said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? There is hope beyond this life. The best is yet to come. Why put your hope in the things of this world? Why store up treasures on earth? And so Paul can write this about death in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 14. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, which is his metaphor for death there. We do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. The best is yet to come. <clears throat> death is not the end. Because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, there is a way to live forever. And the, the writers of the Bible, they struggle to put into words what that will be like on that day when you're with him. You know, they talk about streets of gold, how even the stuff you walk on is beautiful, splendor, wealthy, all of that. They talk about marriage imagery. It's like a bride coming together with a bridegroom struggling to put into words what it's going to be like when we're with him on that day. Paul said this, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So I don't even need to try because my mind is not even conceived yet of what is to come. And again, Paul, 8.18 in Romans, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That on that day, all will, be, all will be restored. All wrongs will be made right. That all our suffering will fade away. That death will be no more. No more weeping. No more suffering. No more death. And all the things that you thought you had lost in this world, the beauty, the intimacy, the health, the significance, the love, the joy, all of it will be yours in abundance forever. This is why Paul said this in Philippians 1.21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Can you imagine having that attitude towards life? As long as I'm living, I'm going to serve the Lord, and when I die, it's going to be even better because the best is yet to come. The death cannot kill us it can only give us life to the fullest. As D.L. Moody put it, soon you will read in the newspaper that I am dead. Don't believe it for a moment. I will be more alive than ever before. That is a great quote right there. This attitude, this belief that the best is yet to come Please understand that this, this, this cuts across some really bad theology out there. Some of you may have heard stuff like that. Some of you may have come from churches like that, the kind of best life now kind of theology that tries to convince you if you just have the positive attitudes, God's going to give you prosperity and blessing here on earth and all that. None of these verses back that up. All the verses that we've read, they proclaim you might always be a slave you might always be in a bad marriage. You might always be single. You may never have kids. You may suffer and be persecuted until the day you die. There's no guarantee that any of that is going to turn around this side of eternity. But your hope is not in the things of this world. Your hope is not in your circumstances. It's not in getting a promotion. It's not in the health improving. Your hope is in God. Your hopes in Jesus dying for your sins and rising from the dead. And you pray with all your heart that God would change your circumstances, and that's fine. You should do that. You should. You should pray for the marriage to improve. You should pray for your health to improve. There's nothing wrong with that. But your hope is not in those things, and there's no formula to getting what you want. Your hope is in Christ. To live as Christ, to die as gain, whatever comes your way, put your hope in him. If you're in a bad marriage, the hope is not that one day it's going to get better or that your spouse will die. Your hope is knowing that no matter what happens, 
whether or not it turns around, that God is at work. God is always at work, working for your good to conform you to the image of his son. That God will use your situation to equip you to minister to others. And your hope is that what your heart is truly longing for, the joy, the intimacy, the love, the security, all of that that your heart is longing for is yours already and forever in Christ. It will not be taken from you, and the best is yet to come. And if your work and your career has not gone as you'd hoped, the hope is not in getting that promotion, you know, or getting that new job, that one day you'll be doing what your heart desires. Your hope is knowing that your identity is not in that. That God's always working for your good to conform you to the image of his son, that he's always working to equip you so that you can minister to others, that your purpose is found in him, that he says, even giving a cup of cold water to a little one has eternal reward and significance. Everything you do for him matters eternally, even if what you feel like you're doing from a nine to five feels meaningless. Whatever you do for him matters eternally. And one day you will reign with him over the new heavens, the new earth, whatever that may mean that you will be fulfilled forever. And if your health is gone and it's not coming back, pray for healing, but your hope is not that miraculously it's going to turn around. Your hope is that no matter what happens, God is always working for your good, conforming you to the image of his son, equipping you to minister to others. And one day, perfect health will be yours forever. There'll be no more suffering, no more pain, no more death. And uh, just, just let whatever you're going through drive you deeper into him. He is the source of all hope and joy. Again, Isaiah 9 declares this. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In this world where there is such a crisis of hope, we have hope. We have the source of all hope. Do not be afraid to share with others the reason for the hope that you have. That your bad things will turn out for good that your good things will never be taken away from you and that the best is yet to come. Amen. Lord, I do pray that you would fill those who are listening today with hope, trusting that you are on the throne, you are continually working for our good, that there is a grander story, a greater narrative that our lives are a part of, that this is not meaningless it is not random whatever it is we are going through and lord we do continue to pray for those who are going through difficult times lord that you would change their circumstances that you would bring healing that you would bring restoration and reconciliation that you would provide that you would do miraculous things but in the end lord our hope is not in those things our hope is in you we declare our trust in you this morning and we lift up right now those in our lives who are hopeless, who are feeling hopeless, who don't know where to turn for hope, who are turning to the wrong things, Lord, to numb their hopelessness. Lord, we pray that you would please reveal yourself to them. Show them where hope is found. Use us in any way that you desire to give reason for the hope that we have, to proclaim the hope of the gospel. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.